So, safeguarding our water, what does that really mean? So, I have an unusual um, position in that some days I'm here at Blink working in agriculture, but other days I get to work in World Vision where I sit on the Board of Trustees. And water across those two environments is completely different. So, our, our vision in World Vision is that by 2030 that we are reaching a new person with water every 10 seconds. Um, today, we're running it every 60 seconds, and last year, 4 million new people got water. And water doesn't mean water in your homes like we're used to. It means a freshwater point in a community, in a village. Um, and that is essential for quality of life, um, to get rid of disease, to improve health care, um, and to allow people to, to thrive, and then communities to thrive. Um, I grew up in Africa, so I sort of understand it. I've seen children walking for long periods of time to get that water, and the water's not necessarily always great either, because when rivers are in flood, we know what's in them. On the other side, um, sitting here today in a country that's blessed with a huge amount of water, um, in a region that's learned to use that water to actually build its communities, to grow things, to innovate and create prosperity. So really two completely different things. But as we look forward, both those groups of people are exposed. And thinking about what's next and having those long-term visions are really, really fundamental to what we need. So it is about what's next and what we need to be building on, given what we know, given what we're discovering, and given what we're predicting. So we've put together a lineup of speakers today for you um, that allow us to start to think about that. We start off with Nick from Landcare, who is part of their climate change and policy team and has done a lot of work on fresh water in Canterbury to really get us to think about what could be ahead and what do we need to be thinking about. As we know that change through farming systems takes time and needs to be planned, needs to be considered. Um, John Penno will then join us. He's well known to all of you as the founder and um, previous CEO of Sinlay. And um, today is also sharing with us, us in his capacity of a new business owner and innovator, as well as his role as chair of the Freshwater Leaders Group. Um, and what we need to be thinking about in that context as we navigate together. And then Mel, Melanie Brooks, the CEO of MHV Water, one of our irrigation schemes in in this region, is really going to start to share about what are we doing today, what are we planning for the future, and what's really happening on farm. We sometimes forget, particularly in this region, actually what we are doing and what we can do and the leadership we're showing and how do we come together and really drive what's next and continue to do that for our country. So I'm going to hand over to Nick, who's our first speaker, and enjoy your morning. Uh, good morning, my name's uh, Dr Nick Kirk. I'm an environmental social researcher from Manaki Whenua Landcare Research based in the Lincoln office. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the latest Canterbury-specific uh, climate change uh, projections. Um, so the first thing that I should um, mention to you is that this was part of a uh, very uh, discrete bit of research that uh, myself and some colleagues of mine at Manaki Whenua did um, with um, Environment Canterbury. Um, and uh, so Environment Canterbury, they were interested in, in doing a report which looked at the most up-to-date Canterbury-specific uh, climate change-based research. Um, they did an initial uh, climate change-related risk and impact assessment, um, and they looked at the easily available peer review and grey literature. Um, they hired us to go through a more systematic process to look through all the scientific databases um, to try and find if there was any gaps in their initial process. Um, that we could help fill. Um, so uh, we did find 68 new different uh, references um, related to climate change um, specific projections for Canterbury, um, and we added those to the report, um, which is currently being completed by Environment Canterbury now. So I'm just going to, um, as I said before, um, report on some of the findings um, from that. Um, what I should also say is that I'm a social researcher, um, which means um, that I can't give you a background about all of the science um, which goes into the different projections um, that have been made. Um, but what I can do um, is provide you um, with an explanation here of the systematic review process, which we went under. So basically, um, you know, we had a look at all the voluminous amount of studies that have gone on. Um, we, uh, we looked at, at the specific gaps that 
we identified through um, the initial report, um, and then we completed the review. Um, but the other thing I can also um, inform you of um, is um, just some general key terms um, that I think will help um, with your knowledge and with the um, and with the different um, projections that I'll be giving first. So um, all of these projections come from something called um, a general circulation model. So this general circulation model is based on equations which have been produced to um, understand the circulation of the seas and of the atmosphere. And from these um, equations, they can simulate um, different um, climate scenarios. Um, so there are 41 um, general circulation models which are run throughout the Earth, and six of these um, have been used to produce a New Zealand-specific regional climate model. Um, so it is from this regional climate model and from these six um, general circulation models that we get the projections which are specific to Canterbury. Um, perhaps what will be of more importance for uh, the remainder of the talk is this phrase here, representative concentration pathways. So what these represent are different potential future scenarios for greenhouse gas emissions. So um, at the top here, RCP 8.5, um, imagine that it's effectively the status quo. So greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise up through 2040 and 2090. Um, oh, can we just go back there a second? Um, and RCP 2.6 up here um, represents, you know, a very strong transition towards trying to limit greenhouse gases as much as possible. Um, these ones in, bet in between um, are sort of potential scenarios in between. So when I present the projections about rainfall, um, about hot days and things like that. These are all dependent on whichever representative concentration pathway has been put into the model. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, there were also, um, oh sorry there, um, also through the presentation I'll be talking about um, uh, three specific types of change and impact. Um, oh. Uh, first, there's uh, climate-driven changes. Um, these are the, the changes that directly happen from the actual climate changing in, our, uh, in Canterbury. So these are, like I was talking about, um, changes to temperature, hot days, extreme rainfall, sea level rises and decreasing frost days and snow days. I'll also talk about transition-driven changes. So these are the changes that will happen um, in response to the climate-driven changes. So changes in law, changes in policy, um, changes in regulation, um, innovation, investment and new technologies. Thank you there, sir. Uh, and then we'll also talk about cascading impacts. So these are the combination of the climactic-driven changes and the transition-driven changes and how they will actually impact um, on both the natural and built environment. Um, so the first um, uh, thing that I wanted to talk about were um, changes in temperature. Uh, so um, of particular interest, I think, to all of you here is that um, hot days, which um, uh, according to the projections, are days in which the temperature reaches 25 degrees or over um, are projected to increase. Um, as you can see there, with the uh, RCP 2.6, so that's um, you know, strong mitigation of greenhouse gases, um, uh, the average um, increase would be capped at 0 0.7 degree um, average increase, um, but um, at the highest um, greenhouse gas uh, representative concentration pathway, um, you can see by 2090 uh, there'd be a 2.8 degree to 3 degree uh, average degree in temperature rise, which would be quite significant. Um, one thing that might be of interest is that this also affects um, frost conditions and cold nights. So those nights that, um, in which the temperature reaches uh, below um, freezing point um, are, spe are expected to decrease, especially in coastal areas, um, and this could have a, a very real impact on the types of um, crops that could be grown um, in coastal Canterbury. Um, in terms of rainfall, um, there's uh, several components to this, and one of them is the snowpack, which falls um, on the main divide. Um, the number of snow days is expected with the latest projections to decrease across Canterbury, uh, and a reduction of the snow season by up to 30 days is possible, especially under the highest um, emissions projections. Um, extreme rainfall, um, um, it's, it's expected that you know, moderate to extreme rainfall events um, are likely to increase. Um, however, um, this is different in different parts of Canterbury. So as you can see down there at the bottom, um, for areas of uh, coastal Canterbury, particularly south coastal Canterbury, there might actually be a decrease um, in extreme um, rainfall events. Um, this variation between um, different parts of Canterbury is also seen on the next slide here. Um, so the amount of which rainfall will change varies depending on the season and as well as the location in Canterbury. 
Um, so generally we see very minor increases in, in all different locations across spring, summer and autumn. Um, but in wintertime, um, the projections become a wee bit more um, unstable. Um, in, in Christchurch, they're predicting a 1% increase to 12% decrease in rainfall over winter. Uh, in uh, Hamna, a 10% decrease to a 1% increase, whereas um, around Tekapo, a potential 6% to 28% increase um, in rainfall. Um, so yeah, these projections, like I say, they vary depending on what part of Canterbury um, you might happen to live in. Um, in terms of drought, um, all of those areas that currently um, suffer um, or have high likelihood of suffering from drought are likely to experience increased drought risk um, through a number um, of different uh, representative concentration pathways. Um, under the mid-range scenario projection, um, we would see you know, drought levels increase by around 7 to 10% um, by around 2030 to 2050, but by 10% um, for 2070 uh, to 2090. So um, a small increase um, in drought um, is projected. Um, in terms of just the hydrology um, of the rivers um, in Canterbury, um, we can expect that mean annual flood rates will increase or remain relatively similar across Canterbury. Uh, increases are largest for the most um, significant um, emissions of, um, scenarios. Um, in terms of mean discharge, um, there's variability, again, across, um, across uh, Canterbury. Uh, southern Can coastal Canterbury tends to become a wee bit wetter. Uh, uh, is particularly for those high emission scenarios, um, whereas other parts of inland Canterbury are projected to become drier. Um, um, so yeah, again, there's variability here um, in terms um, of mean discharge. Um, in terms of the annual low flows, again, unfortunately, there is variability um, in different areas, um, but the overall trend is that rivers will probably reach low flow um, earlier than what they do currently. Um, and as you can see there from the low flow timing, um, in particular, um, you know, the Rangitata, for example, um, will actually reach low flow later because of the different, um, uh, the changes in snowpack um, and the effects that that is going to have um, um, on where the water comes from, whereas the Waimakariri, um, unfortunately, might reach low flow um, slightly earlier under these projections. Um, in terms of sea level rise, which um, is going to have an effect on coastal areas and also perhaps an effect on um, freshwater resources if there's inundation um, under into coastal aquifers. Um, global sea level rise is likely to be in the range of uh, up to a metre um, by 2100. Um, again, this changes depending on the different emission scenario which is put into the model. Um, but the collapse of the polar ice sheets could mean that sea level rise um, happens to go up substantially higher, so there are definite uncertainties um, in terms of these projections at the moment. Um, so just going now to the transition-driven changes. So how will policy and regulation changes um, in, in response to these? How will consumer behaviour change in response to these? Um, will bring about um, certain changes, um, and that's what we refer to here as the transition-driven changes. Um, in terms of land uses, um, these different um, figures for increased demand, increased demand are taken from a number of different um, uh, research projects that have been going on recently. As you can see there, um, there is um, um, suspicion that there will be decreased demand for uh, sheep and beef and dairying land use and that there will be increased demand for things like bioenergy crops, um, local food crops, and uh, the horticulture is predicted to be a more actual um, uh, international demand for new horticultural crops. Um, if there are transitions to land uses, then that increases the competition for, uh, for land, um, which um, could also see to decrease levels of more traditional land uses um, in Canterbury. Um, there are also other different types of transitions. So if we're going to transition towards a completely renewable um, electrical grid, um, there's a high likelihood that that will be less reliable than the you know, the current system which has um, hydro um, and coal and uh, geothermal. Uh, so things like solar, it is much more difficult to be able to um, save that energy and to be able to put it out during high demands. Um, so in that transition, um, there might be, um, as I say out there, uh, certain security of supply um, issues. Um, 
So just to sort of um, continue on on the potential transitions in land use, um, there could be an increase in forestry, uh, uh, particularly if, if there's um, a demand and the incentives are put in place um, to convert from sheep and beef and, and maybe marginal scrubland to forestry. Like I say before, there's um, more demand for bioenergy production and bioenergy crops, um, increased demand for local food consumption um, and competition from dairy farming. Um, so in terms of the impacts that these transitions will have um, and the climate driven changes will have um, on our freshwater environments, um, the water supply will be affected through changes in river flow. Um, we could also see um, changes in water temperature, especially in sort of shallow water bodies like Te Waihora, um, and that this could increase the risk of um, algal blooms and eutrophication in, in these um, water bodies. Um, water supply infrastructure will also be affected uh, by climate change. Um, of course, like extreme weather and extreme storms will put a big pressure um, on this infrastructure. Um, and we want to ensure that what we build now is capable of dealing with the extra pressure that might be put on these systems in the future. Uh, water availability will most likely uh, decrease. Uh, um, and increase uh, plant water use due to higher, uh, you know, due to higher temperatures could affect vegetable yield. Um, the availability of uh, irrigation water will be critical in determining the ongoing viability of land uses um, in particular regions and on certain soil types. Um, but I will say um, that I feel like in terms of um, comparing this uh, situation with other parts of the world globally or other regions within New Zealand, I think we should be um, fairly confident that the water availability issues won't be too harsh here in, in Canterbury. Um, there's also a potential that there will be more uh, waterlogged soils, especially if there, you, you happen to live in a region in which there will be more extreme um, rainfall events. Um, in terms of our built environment, I was talking about the infrastructure before. Um, these could be affected by sea level rises or, or an increase in extreme uh, weather events. Uh, and of course, buildings could be um, damaged um, by these events as well. And although I haven't brought this up here um, because this had a fresh water focus, um, there's also uh, projections for increased um, uh, wind and extreme wind conditions, which I know can have an effect on some of um, farming infrastructure like um, irrigators and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think that sort of illustrates that although I've tried to bring up things that are a freshwater focus here, it's a very complicated system um, and you have to treat the system um, as a whole. Um, uh, you know, there will still be, even if the water availability issues aren't so critical in Canterbury due to the climate change projections, there still could be a whole bunch of other different things um, which affect um, farming and land use in Canterbury um, as a result of changing climate. Um, so um, just some more potential impacts. Um, the efficiency of irrigation schemes um, might decrease um, as uh, rates of evaporation um, increase. So evapotranspiration is, is likely to increase with um, increase in temperatures. Um, but however, many of the yields of many vegetable crops um, could increase um, thanks to carbon fertilization with more carbon dioxide in the air. Um, also perhaps um, of interest is that certain grape cultivars uh, could be more suitable to grow in the conditions of, in, of North Canterbury um, as the temperatures begin to rise and the uh, frosts become less frequent. Um, however, um, other different types um, of crop, um, such as potatoes, um, might have their, um, their crop cycle shortened um, due to these very same conditions. Um, so just to wrap up and give you a couple of broad conclusions before I pass on to the other speakers here. Um, climate change will affect free freshwater resources in Canterbury, but this effect will not be uniform across the region. Um, there is interregional variability, and I think in order to gain more certainty about that, uh, we need to develop uh, more, uh, uh, more detailed uh, climate models which are specific to New Zealand, and that's currently underway um, at NIWA at the model. Um, when we went through the literature review, um, it confirmed that the most latest projections align with the projections which were being made in the early 2000s, the late 1990s and the 1990s. And so for me that, that confirms that you know, these 20 plus years of projections have been basically saying the same thing. And this, I feel, gives us some confidence that we'll have an, at least an understanding about how Canterbury will be impacted by climate change. Um, the degree in which we'll be impacted, I think, is where we have uncertainty. 
So given that, I think adaptation planning can begin, um, but that we should remain flexible um, given still um, some very real uncertainties about um, how we'll be affected. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, so we're going to switch tack now and bring on um, John. And what we'll do at the, at the end is bring everybody back and actually run a Q&A panel. So thanks, for Nick, for really setting a future for us that we need to be thinking about. Um, and I'd like to hand over to John Penner now, who's going to bring it a little bit closer to home as we think about fresh water. All right, thank you. I'm putting my phone there, not for text, but so that I can watch the time, because uh, when I start talking about these things, I can go for an hour or so, and I don't want to do that. Uh, all right, uh, look, good to have you all in the room, um, and uh, like I mean, this, we're right in the heart of, in the midst of, you know, what has been one of the most contentious debates across the farming community, at least, uh, uh, for many <coughs> years, actually. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things coming out of the woodwork and getting mixed up together and, um, you know, a lot of emotion and... Uh, because we're, we're dealing with something really important here. We're dealing with a natural resource that is uh, important to all of us, but we're also dealing with livelihoods and wealth uh, and communities' well-being uh, when we dial forward and think about some of the impacts of some of the changes that are being proposed. Uh, and, and so what I thought I'd do is talk about why the hell have I dived into this? Because I have been asking myself this in the last few weeks, uh, particularly as I've found myself at the, front of, um, uh, at the front of very large farmer meetings at times, uh, listening to the debate, listening to the concern, uh, and actually finding myself at times sitting alongside, the, the, I guess, the political masters of this process who I don't naturally align with. Uh, actually, and I told them that when I took on the role. Uh, and so it's, it, it has caused me to really think through, um, you know, why did I actually do this? Um, uh, uh, and um, and, and it, the, the, the long answer is, is uh, the short answer to a long uh, question is, it's because it is actually very important. And I want to talk about why I think it's important, and then I want to talk about how, uh, you know, it, uh, how I'm thinking about it and how I've certainly, certainly how uh, I have tried to guide the Freshwater Leaders Group, which I've been chairing, um, and therefore the, the process that's, that's unfolding in front of us. So, uh, so let's get into it. Look, my, my background for this, and, and when I was rung, when uh, Damien O'Connor rang me up and said, uh, would you chair this Freshwater Leaders Group, which is going to be an advisory group into the officials who are developing the policy for us on freshwater, I said, no, I will not do that, Damien. Um, uh, and he rang me three times, I said no each time. And in the end, um, somehow I weak, he got me at a weak moment and I, and I said yes. Um, but uh, it, the reason that I, you know, the reason I did it, I'm gonna talk about for a start. Um, all right, uh, uh, let's, uh, I, I do come from a daring perspective. Uh, I, you know, I've, many of you will know I was involved in the Sinlay business for the last 10 years, actually for the last 20, because the first half of the Sinlay business was developing farms here in Canterbury, buying sheep and beef farms, irrigating them, setting up large-scale dairy farms. Uh, the 10 years before that, was, which was the first 10 years of my career, was that after I was at Lincoln, I went off and uh, I, I found myself in the dairy industry, just because in 1991 they were the only people employing graduates. Uh, and uh, worked in Taranaki where I learned about dairy farming uh, as a consulting officer and then went off to Ruakura for 10 years where I, I found myself running a big program of work that had actually been set up by an old chap called Arnold Bryant um, and that program of work was looking at intensifying dairying off the back of the Gap Uruguay round and the people had the foresight to see that that was going to deliver quite big growth in the dairy industry in New Zealand. And so we were looking at intensifying dairy farming systems. How might we use supplementary feeds and nitrogen fertiliser to drive up production on dairying and to allow dairying to occur in places like Canterbury and Southland? Uh, so we ran that program for 10 years. And, and the, the, the amazing piece of foresight, and, and this came from Arnold, not me, but he, he saw that as we intensified, it was going to have an impact on the environment and we better understand what that was. And so alongside the work we were doing, 
Uh, Stuart Ledgard, who I got to know very well through that process, was commissioned to look at the effect on groundwater and climate. This is in 1992, I think, or 93. Uh, and so I came out of that 10 years with a very clear understanding. Stuart and I published a lot of work internationally on, um, on the effect of intensification of dairy farming on groundwater. Uh, and climate. I was always more interested in the water um, than the climate. I didn't, you know, back in 1992, I was 24 years old or something. I didn't really think that much about global warming, um, but but I was interested in water because I was, you know, I'm a boaty and I, it, it, water's a big part of our, of our family and still is. Um, and what I got to know, it, it just it's sort of projecting forward again, what I got to know as a dairy industry which is an exceedingly innovative industry at every level. Um, at, at, you know, the changes that dairy farmers have been able to go through and the people who I worked with when I was working as a scientist were very innovative, very quick to change. If they saw an opportunity, they would run to it uh, and they would figure out how to implement it. Um, of course, like any industry, there are leaders and there are people in the middle who follow along and there are laggards. But on the whole, they're very innovative. Um, and so, uh, sort of later in my career, and, I, and, and as you know, I got involved in this, but it, the, the, the way that Canterbury was developed for dairy farming and the speed that it happened after the pioneers came in, figured out how to do it, and figured out how to do it really well, particularly with some of the new tools that were coming along around intensive you know, nitrogen fertiliser and irrigation tools and... Um, <coughs> You know, the speed at which dairying was rolled out as prices encouraged it, uh, both sheep and beef, well, really the wool price falling away and dairy prices going up, it was absolutely remarkable. In a 10-year period from 2000 to 2010, uh, Canterbury farmers and their families rolled out a dairy industry the size of Taranaki across the province. And leading into that, Taranaki was the second biggest dairying area in New Zealand. Uh, in the midst of that, though, I did understand, and we were doing it, we were buying farms and converting them. I absolutely understood what was going to be happening to the groundwater. Uh, and I tried to engage with the wider industry on that and uh, sort of shake them into action. This is 15 years ago. And we set up a, a thing called the Daring and Environment Leadership Group, which was the first time that we got industry leaders and government leaders around the table to talk about the issue. Uh, we set up an industry strategy to try and manage this, uh, but, but to be frank, the strategy was walked away from because the economic imperatives to grow and allow growth, and this wasn't an industry thing, this is a community thing, they were too great at the time. Um, and so people said, well, we'll think about that later. We'll watch those things later, we'll deal with them. But we knew. We knew what was going to happen to groundwater, to climate, the effects. Um, later in my career, um, you know, we, we developed into the Sinlay business and, and as we developed the milk processing business, the, the principle that we started with was that the customer always comes first. You know, we, we, were, we came from a dairy farming background, but we, I guess we were young enough to know that it, we, we didn't really know what we were doing, so we just read the textbooks and the textbooks said, you know, follow the customer, so that's what we did. So we went out and started engaging with customers. We were very interested in the Chinese market and the infant formula market. Uh, and right back at the start of the business, before we were even collecting milk, we were running focus groups with young Chinese mothers uh, in China. We did it up through China. We also did it in Vietnam um, and a couple of other markets we were interested with. And in the context of this was it was just after the melamine scandal and disaster in China. And every time we talked to them, they told us, uh, they always told us the same thing. If we're going to buy your products, we don't, we'll pay plenty for it as long as we trust that it comes from healthy animals that are well fed and cared for. Uh, and, and interestingly, that always came first and still does actually. Um, that we will, we'll, if it comes from an environment that we trust you're looking after, and the two big issues are climate and water. Uh, and that you're looking after the people who are involved. Because if you're not looking after the people running the business, you, I, I don't believe you'll look after your animals, and I don't believe you'll look after the environment. Now, that, that, it, I, I was always staggered by the foresight that those people had. Um, I mean, when you got them together in these focus groups. This is, this is back in um, 2006. Oh, no, it must have been after, because it was after Melamine, so it must have been 2008, 2009, that sort of period. So over 10 years ago, 
Uh, and wherever we went, they would talk about these things. So we came back and thought about how we start engineering it in, into the business uh, as we go. Um, this is completely, it, over, the, over that 10 years, actually the whole thing's gone completely mainstream. Wealthy consumers across the world now deeply care about the planet uh, whenever you talk to them. Uh, it's coming up through, two, we see it in two, uh, or certainly in my, in my business life, we see it in two places. You see it coming up through the investor community. Um, so when you sit down as a listed company, which we did a lot, you, you sit around with investors and they grill you on what you're doing in the business. And, uh, and when we started doing that, um, every now and again there'd be someone out of the big investment teams who would turn up and want to talk about animal welfare, environment, uh, HR, people issues. Um, but it wouldn't happen much. About five years ago it switched. Uh, today, if you sit in any one of those meetings, what they, they call them ECG people, you know, so they're people who are interested in the non-financial measures around a business. They are the first people to talk and they get the most time. And it's because the investing community are recognising that companies that don't look after those things uh, are, are risky companies. So you don't want to have your money with them. Uh, and in the same way, the big customers are thinking about it in the same way. So if you want a ticket, if you want to sit around the table with the Danones, the Nestle's, uh, the Abbott's, uh, certainly the A2's who we've partnered closely with, uh, they want to know. Uh, they want to know, they want to go to the farms, they want, uh, they, want author, they want to audit the systems. They are watching the debate that's going on in New Zealand right at the moment and it's doing us huge damage. Because what they're seeing is huge resistance from farmers to change to where they want to be. So this is, uh, now look, I'm talking sort of, I can feel myself getting passionate about this, and it's because I really worry about this stuff, which going back to my question is why I sort of dived in, and I'm sitting beside the people that I am at the moment trying to get some change. Um, there's this global goals thing, I don't know if, if has anybody seen this? The UN Global Goals. Um, this has become a bit of a rallying cry. They've, they, over, over the decades, the UN's made several attempts to try and elevate these non-economic issues uh, to get cooperation around them, and suddenly they have got traction. If you look at many of the big companies around the world, they're using these and they're picking two or three, and they're saying, look, beyond profit, we're really going to focus on these things, things like climate change, things like uh, fixing poverty, uh, things like clean water, and making sure that our ecosystems are healthy around our businesses. And, and it's because it's actually deeply important to the world. We all understand that we've got one planet, we've got far too many people. Uh, we understand in ways that we never have before how many of our you know, native species around the world are getting wiped out. This is not something that happened 100 years ago. It's something that's happening now at a faster rate than it ever has before. Um, and so it, it is important. It's coming through in consumers. So people uh, making choices around the products they consume, not based on the nutrition of the products so much anymore, but based on the impact on the environment. Um, so lots of reports from consumers saying we're going to consume less milk and meat because these things are, um, are damaging the environment. Now I'm not saying this, I know there's some farmers in the room, right? And I know that farmers are really worried about this stuff at the moment. I'm not saying this to depress you, I'm just, just saying this is, this is just the environment that we're in and we've got to make sure that we understand it and then adjust as we need to so that we can thrive in the future. I'm not someone who thinks that, that, that you know, doom and gloom, we may as well pack up shop. I'm, I'm not in that space. Um, but we do have to be real, uh, face reality. It, uh, there's another article from recently, you know, how we fell out of love with milk, uh, which as a dairy company person, I don't really like that title. Um, but these are the numbers. So this graph uh, here is the per capita consumption of fluid milk in the US market, which tends to be a lead market in the West. What happens in the States eventually happens everywhere. Uh, it's in pounds because it's American. So back in 1980, the average American consumed about um, 225 pound of milk per capita per year. Uh, last year that was 150. Uh, and that graph is continuing to fall. It's actually accelerated since 2010, 
uh, and it's accelerating downwards because of the, it, people think it's because of the environmental issues. That people are clicking into these intensive farming systems that are having an impact on the environment. Uh, this, this little graph uh, over here shows fluid milk and how that's been changing since 2014, so much more recent, and the growth in dairy alternatives. Um, so the, you know, this, the, the other sorts of milk that don't come from cows. Um, this is the fastest growing uh, milk brand at the moment in Europe, which is called Oatly. Uh, the, 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 um, the European dairy industry had a big fight with them and made them take milk off the carton. So it's just Oatly instead of oat milk, it used to be oat milk. Uh, and it, interestingly though, what happened then, that was when Oatly took off, because it created a lot of publicity. Everyone, oh, it doesn't have cow milk in it, great, I'll buy it. So if there was one point of inflection when Oatly really took off, it was when they took them through the courts and made them take milk off the, off the label. Uh, it's been in the States for much longer. This is a brand uh, that's been in the States for quite some time, Silk. Uh, it's owned by, it was, it was actually started by Dean Foods, which was, was a big dairy company in the States. They, split, they sort of got a bit sick of waiting for it to do something and spun it out. Uh, it sat on the share market for a while. Then, then uh, Danone bought the, the company um, about three years ago now, or two years ago. It was called White Wave by then. It's now called Danone North America. They paid 12 billion US dollars for the company. Um, uh, so they, uh, you know, they, they think it's got a big future. Um, so, so that is that is the context, and and I guess the the reason that going back to answering the question of why I've got involved in this, it is not for political reasons, it's for purely commercial reasons. I genuinely believe that we've got to move New Zealand to a much better place in terms of how we're perceived globally. We think we're good, uh, and actually there's a lot of good things that are happening, but it's just a reality that it doesn't matter how much we're doing on individual farms. And that's what, you know, when you read all about, <coughs> when you read the papers and the farmers saying, uh, hey, we're fencing our waterways and we're doing all these good things, and that's absolutely true. They have done a huge amount and come a huge way. It doesn't go anywhere near counteracting the effect of doubling the size of the industry or chopping down vast areas of trees in the central North Island and turning it into dairy farms in the upper reaches of the Waikato catchment uh, in a catchment that was already overstressed. So it's not the micro issues that we're, we're dealing with the on-farm stuff really well. What we haven't done is, is sat back and, and dealed with the sort of the macro strategy stuff, and that's, and that's where I'm interested. So if we, if we could get to this point, those consumers would think that's great. You know, they would think this is meaningful. Um, yes, they understand foods produced on farms, but they also understand that it interacts with the natural environment, and they think about biodiversity and native species. They th the, peop the consumers are individual people. They don't just think one thing. They sort of, if they're thinking about fresh, if they think about high quality food and they're prepared to pay big premiums for it, they're going to be thinking about fresh water quality. They're going to be thinking about the effect on the environment. They're going to think about biodiversity and how these people who they're working with are interacting with their, with their communities. Uh, again, not new. One of the things that really intrigues me about this current process is it's almost as if people believe that it's just happening. You know, suddenly there's some big piece of legislation or some big change and the government has said, uh, now is the time, big bang. You know, people compare it to the removal of subsidies in the 1980s. I've heard people talking about that. Uh, the Land and Water Forum started up 10 years ago. It was supported by the previous government. Uh, and it was a very big forum. I'm sure people, there may well be people in the room who are involved in it because hundreds of people were involved in this process over 10 years. Uh, they had uh, NGOs, so Fish and Game and uh, Greenpeace and Forest and Bird, people like that. Uh, they had the big, big industry organisations, Dairy and Dead, Beef and Lamb. They had Federated Farmers. They had the big companies. Everyone was around the table trying to grapple with this issue and figure out what we needed to do in terms of sorting out fresh water. And they came out with a series of recommendations, a series of reports. They've got a website, it's worth looking up. Um, and if you want one snapshot of what they did, there was a report that came out in May 2018, which was sort of their final report at the end of that time. Um, in that report, now under that report, um, and this I find this really intriguing. Under that report, 
the previous government put out three national policy statements for fresh water. Nick Smith, put, he, he published, the, they, they gazetted, if you like, the first national policy statement for fresh water in 2011. It had never been done before. They said the regional councils have got plans, they're a bit all over the show, they need national direction when it comes to fresh water. So they put out the first NPS in 2011. Now, if there was one big bang moment, that was it. Because for the first time, national standards were set for fresh water. Uh, everyone got, you know, there was a lot of science going on, and so they looked at, uh, at this more and more closely. And it's been up, it was updated again under the previous government. Um, and I was very supportive of this. I thought that, great, at last someone's doing something. Um, they updated in 2014. Concepts like Tamana Otawai came in. So the water comes first. Uh, essential human needs come second. Um, and only then commercial comes first. Now, I, I'm going to farmer meetings at the moment. I've been in farmer meetings with about 5,000 farmers. And they're jumping up and talking about these concepts that were put in place uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, as if they were being put in place today by these baddies of Wellington. Um, now, there are, it is true that the current process is tidying up some of the edges, all right? So there are some things that were knocked out of the process previously that really should have been there that are being put back in at the moment. Uh, but for some reason, you know, everyone's, you know, it's, it's a big change. And part of it's politics because the government want to have a big thing this particular year uh, that that's sort of that's that that they'll get support for going into the next election. So there's a lot of politics in behind this in terms of the way it's being presented. Um, so land and water forum, uh, very sensible, good stuff, um, all all things we needed to do, and very much in line. It, even though this was a process driven by the previous government, it actually sets the blueprint for what we've done. The chairman of this process is on the Freshwater Leaders Group for me. And, and when he, when when we started, and I took on the role, I said, "Look, I'm only going to do this if we're carrying on implementing this very sensible thing. So I don't want to dream up a whole lot of new stuff. You guys have spent 10 years working through deciding what needs to be done. This is about getting that implemented. It's not about dreaming up anything new." And yep, yep, yep. So he, so Hugh Logan uh, was the guy who was leading that, and he's a very, very uh, good guy. Um, the, the big challenge, of course, is that you know we would look at this and say that looks pretty good. Actually, it's a Waikato photo. It's not a local photo, but that, that's, that looks pretty good. The problem is, though, what, what we do know is that while we, we've done the easy stuff, we've fenced off the waterways and we've planted them out, we've stopped raw effluent getting out of, uh, out of cow sheds and into waterways. We did that a long time ago. We've stopped putting runoff out of ponds into water and we're spreading it to land. But, but what we are doing is we've, we're running pretty intensively. You know, if you look at the, the farmers in the room will look at those pastures and say, you know, pretty high stocking right there because if we can see from the pasture quality, they've been well grazed and they're nice and green and even and that means there's a fair bit of nitrogen fertiliser going on there. So this is a pretty intensively run farm and we know that water's going down through there and it's carrying nutrients with it. Now that is hard to manage. That is not easy to manage. Uh, it's resulted in water quality uh, really falling away um, in the intensive areas of the country. So yellow is uh, bad, um, you know, too much nitrogen in there for this concept called ecosystem health. Too much uh, nitrogen for healthy uh, ecosystems. Now, again, I, I find that there's a lot of talking past each other when we come to water quality. You know, I think there's a lot of farmers out there who are concerned that we're aiming for pristine for unrealistically good, for, for water as it might come out of a mountain stream. It's, that's not the case. Um, the, the, the target, it, it, what, I, what I got our group to do was to go, okay, what does good look like? Let's debate what good water quality looks like. And what we determined and all agreed on, and this is the farmers in the room and the freshwater ecologists and the water activists in the room, what we all agreed was that if water is... Uh, good enough quality that it supports good, strong ecosystems within those water bodies, the sort of ecosystems that you would expect to be there. So healthy fish, healthy native fish, healthy insect life, um, and did not support the things you don't want there, which are high bacterial loads, slime, uh, which they call periphyte and um, things like that, then that's about the right balance. So we want it to be healthy and alive. Um, you know, we want to be able to swim in the places we want to swim in, 
Um, but we're not going for pristine. We're not going for unrealistically high because we're, we, we, you know, we're, we've got communities out there who are living around these things and, and that's just not the way the world works. Um, and then we passed it to the scientists and said to the scientists, and it, uh, I know, again, one of the myths in this is that we went to Mike Joy and asked Mike Joy. We did not ask Mike Joy. Um, Mike Joy was on the science panel, but he was amongst 14 experts. Now, I've got no patience for the rumours that I hear that this was not science-led or based. It was not led by soil scientists, but that wasn't the question. The question is, show us the science that leads to healthy ecosystems and fresh water so that we can set the sort of numerics that we need. Now, the other myth in this is that this is the first time this was done. They're only adding about two metrics to a whole basket of metrics that are already there in the fresh water standards. Back in, in 2014, I think it was, the Perry Fighton standards came in, which is slime. Right? So regional councils have been required by law to manage water standards so that we don't have excess growth of the slimy stuff, which is a, which is a monitor, which, which is a, 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 an indicator of freshwater health. It's not a perfect one, but it was the best they had at the time. So they said, let's target that. Um, in a number of areas in the country, uh, the Perry Fighting Standard that was put in uh, five years ago is a tougher measure than the current nitrogen standards that's being imposed or being suggested. Um, now, there are some issues in that because just as we now understand there are some places where the nitrogen standard being required is probably too tough and unrealistic, and I don't think we'll make it personally. I think that we'll manage that somehow um, because nobody wants to see um, you know, big areas of Canterbury you know, moved away from pastoral agriculture. That's not realistic. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some farms in some areas that are going to have to change uh, land use back to something less intensive. Um, but, but the Perry fighting stand is a bigger problem than the nitrogen, and that's already there. We're going to have to re I think we're going to have to go back and revisit the, the, the Perry fighting standard. So how, how do we get on with this? Um, what I've been describing is you actually need a scientific definition of what good quality looks like. Yes, we can agree. I, I think we can agree qualitatively. Um, I, haven't heard any, I haven't had anyone come up to me and say, well, I don't like your qualitative decision. I don't care if, there's, if the water quality means that everything, you know, that stuff starts dying and it's full of stuff we don't want there. People don't disagree with that. So then you, if we can agree the numbers, then regional councils can set up plans to help us get to the numbers. And that is the council's job. Their job is, it is not Wellington's job to go catchment by catchment and say, this is what thou shalt do. It's that you've got to work with the communities, have got to work with the regional councils to get there. Um, so we need, to, we need to be able to quantify the allocation limits for individual catchments, and then we need plans to help us get there. And that's got to be robust. Um, we've got to stop the decline. So yes, it's true that there's a whole lot of rivers that are getting better, and that's great. But it's not the debate. It's not the argument. That's like saying there's a whole lot of drivers who obey the speed limit, um, but if 20% give it no regard at all, you've got a problem, right? So I don't, I, I don't know why we're talking about... Uh, yes, we all agree that the sum is getting better, and that's fantastic, but we also agree that there's a whole bunch that are getting worse, and we've got to stop it. And the reason we've got to stop it, again, is purely economic. If I'm a farmer and I'm in an area that's getting worse and I've been there for 10 years, why should I carry a higher financial burden because someone's allowed to convert upstream or do something upstream that, or it isn't fencing upstream that's making my situation much worse. Right? So we've got to, in the, in the catchments that are getting worse, everybody is going to face a much higher financial consequence in the future if we don't stop the decline immediately. And some of the, the reality is some streams are getting worse really quite quickly at the moment. The biggest issue is not nitrogen. Nitrogen's become a bit of a lightning rod. The biggest issue is sediment particularly in Southland, particularly around forestry. Um, there is uncontrolled sediment going into waterways, which is doing a lot of damage in places. Um, <coughs> but it's, it, it seems it hasn't come through. Uh, it, it, I'm not quite sure why it's not. More Maybe in the Southland meetings uh, it would. Um, we've got to improve this. Uh, we've, we've got to improve the system. Um, 
So the freshwater planning processes have got to be more efficient. At the moment, they're getting all bogged down. And I think that providing, getting it locked in and providing certainty, this has actually been moving since about 2010. Um, we've seen that in Canterbury a bit, you know, new rules coming in, things to be getting tougher, and people are a bit worried that it's just a sliding scale that's going on forever. I think that's part of the reason that farmers are so worried about this stuff. They've now, they're used to sort of four or five years of things getting worse and worse and worse. Where does this end? It needs to end, and where it'll end is where we get a robust, um, uh, it, a robust NPS in place, national policy statement, which is what we're working on at the moment. And then the regional councils have got to take that and turn that into plans that they can then implement, not over a couple of years, but over a generation or even longer. Because that's how long it's, it's taken us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to get to the end point. Uh, there are catchments in Canterbury that won't get to the standards for probably 100 years. And that's okay. I actually think that's okay. You set your standard, you put in place a plan, and then you have to work with your communities and your farmers to figure out how you're going to get there. You don't go in and say, it's, it's completely unrealistic to say that you're going to be there tomorrow. You're just not going to be. Or in five years, the things that have taken generations to get to are going to take generations to get away from. And, and, and the regional planning process will handle that. But, but there's this key date of 2025. If, if, left un, if, if we don't uh, bring this in, these things are going to run out till 2030. Now, are there any farmers in the room who would like continuing uncertainty until 2030? I, you know, I, I just don't think anyone wants that. So, we, look, so then it's a balance of how quick is too quick. Uh, my view is that five years is a reasonable sort of time frame. It gives communities enough time to engage in this properly. And people are worried at the moment about the consultation process. It's relevant. Current consultation process doesn't really matter. It's what happens with the councils uh, that really counts. And then we get to the really tough stuff. And to be honest, this isn't dealt with yet. Once uh, catchments are identified as over-allocated, how do you allocate who gets what in catchments that actually need to reduce loads significantly? And um, I won't go through this in detail because I can see Tony walking up to the front, which means stop talking, John, and you haven't looked at your phone. Um, so I'll leave it, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, just one final point, though. Um, nothing is more important to us as farmers in terms of maintaining the value of our assets or making our farms run well than the people we need to run them. And the one thing that I have not seen in these farmer meetings is many people under the age of about 45. And yet they are the people running the farms and the people who are going to be buying the farms. And what I can tell you is they understand these issues and they care about them in a way that we don't quite fathom. Um, and so we do need to think about how we bring them into the debate and how we engage them. And there's no faster way to disengage the next generation and to sort of put up, the, the, then to not take the action we need to, to get some of these issues back on track. So it's just a thought I'll leave you with, and um, I'll hand on to the next speaker. Thanks, John. Um, so we're going to shift gear again, and Melanie Brooks is going to um, share some of the thinking of where we are today in one of our irrigation schemes, and we've got a few of them with us today. And then given the infrastructure that we run that is, um, has a very long horizon to us, how do we think about what's next and where we're going and what are the kinds of discussions and plans that are underway? Um, and then we'll pull back to a Q&A session with yourselves, with the panellists. So think about the kinds of things you would like to ask as we um, come to the end of the next um, session. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Tony. Am I on? Does it sound on? It does kind of sound on. Um, kia ora tato, um, e um, It's great to see so many people here today. And um, like you, um, I'm, and like our farmers, I'm really passionate about um, fresh water and our water quality. In New Zealand, it's our, our ocean and our rivers that is our playground. It's where we fish. It's what sustains us. It's taianga. That's why it's so critically important that we get this right. So um, I'm going to be taking it sort of back down a level to that farmer space. And um, I think it's really important that we don't generalise here because, um, especially on farmer attitudes, because 
we've actually made a lot of progress already, and that's a little bit of what I want to touch on today. So in Canterbury, um, the, oh, actually, I probably need a bit of a clicker, don't I? Oh, is it behind me? It's behind you. Um, so in Canterbury, the um, Canterbury Water Management Strategy came out in 2009. And what was really important about the strategy is it actually recognised, and I'm going, to, I'm going to read it, so enable present and future generations to gain the greatest social, economic, recreational, or cultural benefits from our water resources with an environmentally sustainable framework. And we've made quite significant inroads. We've got a really robust land and water regional plan um, here in Canterbury. And, um, and other than a couple of outliers in the proposed national policy statement for freshwater management, we're actually well on board with that. Um, we, the farmers in our region are leading the way, they are ahead of the curve and I think it's really important that we recognise that. And one of the really important things about the, the way that we've approached our land and water regional fr planning framework is that we've recognised that there's a number of different areas within our catchment that are different, that face into different challenges and it's important that we give those communities the opportunity to solve for the problems that are unique to them. So there's 10 different zones within the Land and Water Regional Planning Framework, and here we're, we're part of that Ashburton zone. So we know there's work to be done, and we are doing it. So um, my role here today is just to clarify a little bit of what we've done in that infrastructure space. Um, and I know there's a wide-ranging audience here, so I'll also talk about what's being done on farm, um, and then wrap up with some of the strategic sort of perspective that we need to perhaps be thinking about from an infrastructure perspective. So we're an irrigation scheme, and like the majority of irrigation schemes, we're a cooperative. We're a farmer-owned cooperative. Um, and so up until about five years ago, we used to deliver water to the gates of our farmers and we used to say, knock yourselves out. Go do your thing. Do your worst. <laughs> now we have storage. Um, we deliver water off the back of orders. Um, we manage the environmental compliance for our farmers. We provide advice, education and support. And importantly, we help translate the high level expectations and requirements to what's needed practically on farm. So our roles have materially changed over the last few years. So the Rangitata River, um, we get the majority of our water from the Rangitata River. And the health of our waterways is critically important to what we want to achieve. Um, there is a water conservation order on, on this river, and, um, and it's a beautiful river. I'm, I've had a close connection with the river since I was a kid. Um, as the flow reduces in the river, so too does our ability to take from the river. We have a run of the river water take. And this is, this is important to note. And the reason it's important is because storage is such an important component because we want to be able to leave water in the river for when it's needed for the health of that waterway. So obviously storage is important and we can capture water when it's plentiful and we can distribute it when it's needed. And the Canterbury Water Management Strategy recognises the importance of having regionally significant infrastructure um, and, and for those, that infrastructure to achieve balanced outcomes. And so what is being done in that storage infrastructure space? And we've got minimum flows. So water for storage is, has many different benefits. And the Apua Dam, for example, its primary use and its primary objective is to achieve a minimum flow in the Opahee River. We also have storage where it helps buffer environmental effects from flooding. We have storage for recreation purposes, for fishing, for swimming, for skiing, for canoeing, for rowing. Um, and it's a really important part of our culture. Um, as well as providing for that farming resilience. So places like the Opua Dam actually achieve all of those attributes. Um, and I think that it's really important that we recognise that the, the storage is multifunctional when it comes to, to water and really important to be able to deliver on all of those aspects for our community aspirations. So at MHV, um, we are one of the original irrigation schemes in New Zealand. Um, We've been delivering water since the 1940s. Um, and I'm going to take a little bit of a step back, because um, up until um, recently, we, we would deliver water on a fortnightly basis. And our farmers would take that water on a fortnightly basis, because if they didn't take that water, they would need to take that water again. They wouldn't get the opportunity for another two weeks. And because of their soil types and our climate, 
we're no more than a couple of weeks away from a drought at any given time. And so farmers would take the water just in case. And so I refer to this as where we were in our, our just in case irrigation phase. And then we kind of evolved a little bit. Um, with the drive for efficiency, many farmers wanted to put pivots onto their farms. And when you put a pivot on, you want to be able to utilise that to the best of its ability. To do that, farmers put on on-farm storage because they wanted to capture that water that we could deliver on a fortnightly basis and then irrigate it out over the course of that two weeks. So it, this was a bit of a game changer because it meant that our farmers could evolve. They could, they could no longer just put the water on whenever it was available. They could actually just put the water on when it was needed. And so that was a, a bit of an evolution to the just-in-time irrigation. So across our, we've got 206 shareholders at MHV, and across those shareholders, they've got approximately 9 million cubic metres of on-farm storage. So it's quite a significant component of our infrastructure, and that's held on-farm. So what we also did at MHV is we recognised that that infrastructure was critically important. We saw some of the challenges ahead with climate change, with supply, and what that might look like. And so we invested in another 6.3 million cubes of storage in our Karoo ponds. Now, our Karoo ponds um, really changed the mindset. And over a period, so, so the corresponding period after the ponds went in, we saw a reduction of the amount of water that was applied by the farmers over the same period that there was a reduction in rainfall. So that tells you that our farmers were changing mindset. They were only applying water when the water was needed because they knew that it was available. And this is a picture of um, our Karoo ponds and that evolution. So we've gone from the, the just-in-case to the just-in-time to now where we're just applying enough water for the plant and for the, for the soil profile to ensure that we're not, we're not breaching that field capacity. sneak through here. So well, the other part of infrastructure obviously is around um, is piped infrastructure. So um, within our scheme we've got about 100 kilometres of piped infrastructure and about 320 kilometres of open races. And many schemes across Canterbury and Otago have, have put in um, probably over half a billion dollars of investment into piped infrastructure. The reason piped infrastructure is important because it enables us to take advantage of gravity and take advantage of um, re re reduced evaporation and leakage and to ensure that we're delivering um, under pressure to our farmer's gates so they can use less energy. So it's a really efficient way to be able to deliver water. Again, that's at the cost for our farmers. So what is regionally significant or what does infrastructure need to look like in the future? Um, I think we need to be thinking about regionally significant silo-less infrastructure where we look at urban and rural infrastructure and we think about what we need to be doing for the future. Um, piecemeal infrastructure developments can work, but we're really missing, I think that we're missing the boat. When we think about our environmental obligations, we think of that as a catchment and as a country what we want to achieve. But when we think about what we're doing for infrastructure, we, we seem to be missing that. Um, a lot of the, the, the social, cultural and economic wealth that we have in this region is as a result of the, inf, inf, the foresight back in the 1930s by the Think Big infrastructure projects that looked to deliver and build these irrigation networks. Um, we, I, if I take a step back and I look at the Irrigation Acceleration Fund and what that was trying to achieve, I think perhaps the naming or the wording of the fund was incorrect because what they were trying to do was bridge a gap and to, to look at that overbuild requirement. And rather than the current users funding that overbuild, it was looking at how, as a community, we can fund that overbuild so in the future we have relevantly sized um, infrastructure for the benefit of our whole community. And so I, th I, I think it was probably a little bit premature and, and perhaps a name change was, was more appropriate. So I'm going to talk about the on-farm changes. So I've been with MHV for a, a little over a couple of years now, and um, I've seen some considerable change in that time as well. Um, I know that on-farm changes in the past have unknowingly contributed to groundwater degradation. Our farmers know that. We, we're putting up our hands. We have put up our hands. And there have been changes made accordingly. Um, 
So to provide a little bit of, of guidance around what we're doing in mid-Canterbury, um, because I think it's fair to say that ECAN have been taking us on a journey, and we, we are on that journey, especially around the land and water regional planning frameworks, is that all of our farmers have farm environment plans. Those plans are really important because they identify the key areas where we know that if they're not well managed, um, leaching can occur. And so the areas of those farm plans that address are around nitrogen, irrigation, cultivation and soils, effluent water bodies, point sources and water use, and that's water use outside of irrigation. Those are the key things um, that can, when not managed well, contribute to leaching. Um, and those farm environment plans, they're not a tick the box exercise. Um, they have absolutely evolved. Now we, we follow the plan, do, check, act model um, at MHV, which is around how we, how we work with our farmers. So the, the planning piece is the one-on-one -on -one with, our, with our farm environment consultants every year. So they, they come in, they have a conversation, they talk about what's happening, talk about what educational opportunities are available, and, and really get a bit of a feel and a lay for the land. Um, the, the do piece, that's the actions. That's the actions as part of the farm environment plan that get undertaken. The check is the farm environment plan audit and nutrient budget audit that gets undertaken. And they're done by an independent person who comes on farm and looks at what's being achieved. And, look for, and that includes a site visit. And for any of our farmers, they're rated from an A through D. And for any of our farmers who get a C, now we haven't had any Ds um, as yet, but if any of our farmers get a C, we recognise that the most important thing is to wrap education around them. So we wrap support around our farmer and we work with them around what are the things that they need to do to achieve an improvement in their practices on farm, which in turn will achieve an improvement in the, in the environmental outcomes. So we have quite a lot of work that gets wrapped around these processes on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, and we really do recognise that education is the key um, for us to do improvement. And so when we think about education, this is just some of the things that we were looking at last year. Um, we looked at irrigation calibration. There was effluent management workshops for those who it was relevant for. And because we do need to remember that our, our entire area is not um, dairy farming. Um, there was a lot of work on, um, on strategies for reduced nitrate leaching. And so we've got to be very mindful of what are the programs that we're running. And we use the catchment level farm environment plan data and the audit results to be able to identify where there's further opportunities for us to educate our people. And where we can see those gaps, we try and make a difference, wrap around that support and move forward. So I've um, borrowed this um, slide from Derry. Um, from, from, from the Forages for Reduced Nitrate Leaching Trial, so I appreciate that. But in, in terms of the trials and the things that we're doing and, and the actions that are happening at the moment, most of them are around what's in the nitrogen cycle. Um, that's how we're playing off most of the trials and the, the research that's being done. There's not going to be a silver bullet. There's going to be lots of little things with incremental change that together will achieve the improved groundwater outcomes that we want. Um, and I think it's really important just to sort of say that, is that we do want to see improved groundwater outcomes and surface water as well. So the Forages for Reduced Nitrate Leaching Trial, which I stole this slide from, um, are doing some fantastic work. They have monitor farms and they're ironing out a whole lot of challenges um, around those mixed pasture species and what that looks like. Um, we've got the use of plantain, which is a really interesting one because it acts as a diuretic, so the cows pee more often, what they're peeing has less nitrate in it, and the plant is taking it up as well more quickly. These are little small things, but they do make a difference. We've got trials of denitrifying bioreactors that we have within our scheme, and the bioreactors are really effective. They're a carbon source that gets put in, in the path of a, a waterway, a, a tile drain, and the, the microorganisms that eat the carbon, breathe the nitrate, and breathe out nitrogen gas. We've seen some really significant improvements when we've, when we've been doing these trials. Um, there's other research. Um, there's some visual, um, visual fertilizer applications. There's a number of sustainable food and fiber fund um, funded projects and, um, and regenerative, regenerative farming. And, and, and I think that's the key. It's we need to make sure that we're continuing to push 
around these science-led innovations. One of the pieces that I'm also really passionate about from here in, in Mid-Canterbury is our, um, our managed aquifer recharge projects. So the Hekio Hines Water Enhancement Trust has recently been formed to take over and to expand on the work done by the Managed Aquifer Recharge Governance Group for the last three years. So what this, with what this slide shows you, and the laser's not working, um, the, the navy blue line shows an increase in the groundwater level and a reduction in the nitrate level as that green layer. So the Managed Aquifer Recharge has a number of different objectives. The primary objective is to safeguard groundwater quality for drinking water supplies. It uh, also looks at maintaining the, um, the stream volumes and groundwater and um, the lowland streams. And it also looks at the, um, enhancing the ecological values in those spring-fed drains. So we're seeing some really great site, um, results at the initial Lagmore site. And we also have um, new sites that are across the, the plains. This is one of the new sites um, at, at Riverbank. It's, it's a way for us to look at different ways that we can be working within our environment. So this is, this is um, I think you could go so far as to say pristine, pristine alpine water that is going into, um, through an infiltration basin. And this project is community led. It was established by the Ashburton Zone Committee on request of the Zone Committee. Um, which was one of those original groups that I talked about as part of the land, land and water regional planning framework. And it's community led. We had recently, this site was opened. And it was opened by the Honourable David Parker and also by um, Michael McMillan from Arafenua joined us um, and Pete Lowe who is the chair. We opened that site. We had some fantastic feedback from Fish and Game around the way that they're leading some biodiversity plantings and the progress that we're seeing in some of our drains. Um, as a result of that. In fact, we've got a lot of juvenile youth, um, both native, juvenile youth, juveniles in both the native and exotic species are, being, are flourishing in the, these environments. And so I think it's really important that we recognise those. We also have um, the targeted or near river recharge sites that we have locally. This is a really critical one for us because it, it's a way of being able to foster wetlands, being able to um, work within, a, there's a lizard habitat here, which is this area here. So water siphoned out of the Rangitata Diversion Race and it goes through a number of basins, it feeds into this wetlands here, and then it runs down through those infiltration basins. So it's really great because it also looks at how we can be getting, um, breeding more tuna or eel. Um, and so it's a great collaborative, collaborative undertaking. So when I look ahead, um, I've already talked a little bit about the regionally significant infrastructure, and, um, but I think we need to pivot around um, our resilience. So um, I often describe MHV as a change management company, um, not, an, not an irrigation scheme. Um, we've gone through a lot of change in the last couple of years. We know what works and what doesn't work when it comes to change. And we know that we're facing into a lot of change within our industry. So change happens when that change is aligned to the values of the people who want to see that change. And those values and that alignment, they need to believe that the proposed change is going to achieve that as well. And when I think about the conversations that I've been having recently, every farmer I'm talking to wants improved water quality outcome. That's a, that is a given. I don't think that that's up for debate. The challenge we have are the roadblocks. Road One of the roadblocks is uncertainty. We're working through a framework here as part of the plan change two of the land and water regional plan. We have objectives that we need to achieve. So we need to achieve a 36% reduction in the Hekio Hines Plains by 2035. And the first of those reductions starts in 2025. But don't think that we're waiting for 2025 to achieve that. We are well on our way to achieving that now. The uncertainty that gets thrown into the space is a real, um, it's, it's a bit of a derailer when it comes to change management. I think the other challenge we have are regulatory tools um, where the outcomes can be manipulated and where it layers cost and where people don't trust the outcomes that are being achieved from those tools. And I think it's really important that we work through that challenge because it again is another derailer. 
And I think the, the really important part with change management is genuine consultation. And we need to make sure that we are genuinely consultating right through any of this change process. So we've already got a number of tools in our tool belt. We know what we need to do, but we also know we need to do more. So we need to make sure as, a, as an industry we're nurturing innovation. And that innovation needs to be collaboratively led. We need to make sure that that collaboration and the silos that we have within our industries are thrown out the window and we actually start to look at this as what's important for our regions. And that lead needs to be through runanga, through science and through our communities because actually together we can make a real difference. Now I don't believe that, um, that what we're looking at here, especially around the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Quality, I don't believe that it's unachievable. I think that we can achieve it, especially here in Mid-Canterbury. I think we have the resilience within our infrastructure networks and I think we have the people and the drive to make it happen. And I think we just need to keep getting on and doing it and we need to continue to lead the country in this because we have the opportunity to actually demonstrate what we are doing and what we can do. So, thank you. Okay, we're going to bring up our three um, keynote speakers to um, now to um, sit up on a panel. And I'm going to give you the first chance for questions. Just a question, uh, I guess, to, to John, <coughs> following the address and, and your comment about uh, why young people aren't as engaged as we might like. And I probably reflect on that uh, when I went home from the Ashburton uh, meeting of Freshwater with our son, uh, whose comment to me was, well, Dad, what career do I look at now? And I think, you know, to be blunt, John, we've had the shit kicked out of us and... Uh, and probably lost a little bit of motivation in terms of where the go forward is. And I think we need um, some clear uh, focus in terms of where that future might run for these young folk. And maybe you might be able to enlighten us in some of those opportunities. Uh, w look, I'm, I'm of the view that, uh, you know, agriculture in New Zealand, farming in New Zealand has got a huge future. It's not going anywhere. And we need young people coming through um, because if you look at the average age of farm owners, it keeps going up. Um, those assets have got to go somewhere and be run by someone. They're not going to go away. Uh, and, and I think that um, it, the other thing that's worth thinking about for, you know, when we're worrying about the cost that is being laid in here, and there is no question that this is bringing cost, as, you know, that's... that's as the world gets more sophisticated and as we get access to more sophisticated markets, they demand more of us and that means costs often go up. But it's actually happening all around the world. And so the, the cost production, the cost base of food across the world is actually going up through these things at the moment. Now, traditionally there's been technology that comes along and balances some of that out and I think that those things will be there again. So I, for one, I'm not, I... Um, like I, mean, I don't think the future is any less bright. In fact, I think it's brighter for New Zealand now than it was 20 years ago. Um, yeah, that's, that's my view on it. Because um, yeah. I think that we're positioning, we're, we're taking these issues on, we're positioning ourselves well, and you know, those big markets like China are there, um, they're wanting our products, they want us to sort some of these things out, and we are. Um, but, but it doesn't, so for your son, tell him, don't go anywhere, stay here. I guess my point was that I think that they do, that generation often understands the environmental issues better than our generation do, you know. They, they are often, not always, but often they're, they're more attuned to them, they want to get on and do them, they see it as just part of what we, you know, what, what we need to do. Um, yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Mel? Um, I, I see, um, I, I kind of understand a little of what you're saying. Um, when we have our, um, our shareholder meetings, we're actually starting to see, um, since this environmental piece came in, we're actually starting to see a, a, a wider variety of, of age groups coming along to the meetings, which is, which is really positive. Um, I think, I agree with you, I think there is a lot of opportunity within the industry. Um, and, and I think that there is a... Um, I think at the moment that feeling of um, what do we do now is impacting on people's appetite to remain in the industry. Um, and we just need to be really careful with some of our language around that.
It, it, just one more comment. It, I do find it intriguing. I don't think there's been a better time to get involved and buy for a long, long time. Because um, you know, values are down a bit. Interest rates are really low, so the cost of capital is low. Uh, and uh, product prices are looking strong. I, I, so I, I, and, and I do understand that there are more costs coming along and there's a lot more complexity. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be buying. But it's, but it's not actually just about the, the interest costs being low. Because actually the access to capital at the moment is, is really challenging. We've got banks shutting up shop with increased capital adequacy coming on at a, at a national level. And so we've got farmers who are getting pressure around, their, they're looking at, okay, they've got what's happened with Mbovis if they're, in, if they're in a dairy space. They've got the challenges with what's happening in the ETS. They've got, there's been a whole lot of bylaws around stock water. We've had the dam safety proposed regulations come out. We've got the um, NPS for freshwater, the environmental standards. And so all of those things have come out within a period of, I don't know, two months. And so, and so it's not, and, and along with that, they've got the challenges from their banks putting on extra pressure. I mean, it is a really difficult time for the industry. Sounds like opportunity to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's on. Oh, are you sure it's on? Yep. Okay. Um, Neil Brown, Deputy Mayor of Ashburton, and I have a um, passion for Ashburton, and the three speakers are really good. But my question is probably going towards Nat, and it's on climate change. Mm. We um, are doing our bit in New Zealand, we need to do our bit, and don't disagree with that. Trump and Co are not going to do much from what I'm understanding. We're so small in the climate change, whatever we do here is not really going to affect the, the world. So they've got to do their bit to affect here, um, but we still need to do our bit. Now I'm thinking now of Ashburton, you're talking about um, a two degrees warmer, worst case, um, a bit more rainfall, we need to collect it and store it, um, less frosts. For me and Ashburton living here, that sounds like really good. Um, that we could grow different crops, which is different advantages. So I'm just wondering, being really parochial here, mm. what's wrong with climate change? Um, so I think there are, uh, uh, perhaps what I should say is that there are, uh, ooh, that's no good is it, <laughs> the power of my voice, um, um, as a researcher I look at climate change in sort of two different ways, there's adapting to the changes that are going to happen and there's trying to mitigate. Now, in terms of comparing us with huge emitters like the US and China, we can't yeah, mitigate to the same degree that they can. Um, so I think that becomes more of, let's say, a moral sort of question. It's where do you choose to go down that path? In terms of adaptation, I think what my presentation showed and what you've highlighted is actually that perhaps in comparison with other parts of New Zealand and other parts of the world, um, the situation in Canterbury won't be so bad. There will be new opportunities that come about because of the change in climate, but um, it's the transition-driven changes, which is really what we were just talking about before, which is all the new rules and regulations, what John was talking about, the changing attitudes of international uh, markets. Um, those are the things that I think will bring the pressures on the local districts like Ashburton. So it might not be so much the actual climate changes that, that um, you know, cause, you know, uh, you know, perhaps social unrest or difficulty with economic growth. It might be more those different transition uh, level changes. It, it, the, other, the other point I'd make is that is, in terms of the consumers we're targeting, we are not targeting Trump supporters. All right? We're supporting the guys, the people in North America who are horrified that Trump is their president and some of the things they're doing. You know, the wealthy consumers through the United States are the people who are watching. They're horrified about what they're doing. And if we follow suit, if we say, oh, well, no one else is doing anything, so we won't, they'll look for, to buy from people who are. And, and I think it's the strategic risk that we're setting up is, is very real if we don't act on these things. You know, and, this, and, and, uh, and I'm not saying that we aren't doing it. You know, the, uh, I really enjoyed Mel's presentation, you know, to see the layering of things that are going on. is absolutely fantastic. They are the things that we need to be doing, and, and I know are going on out there. And that's what we need to tell the world that, that mm. we're doing. Yeah, we do. So I'm not suggesting we shouldn't do anything. I think we should do something. 
thing. Mm. But what I'm getting at is the what we do is not going to make a big effect. So we need to capitalise on it. Yeah, right. And do the stuff you're talking about, and um, we've all talked about have it, nitrogens and waters and whatever. Mm. Yes, do it, but capitalise on it, and um, because it's going to happen whether we, no matter what we do or not. Mm. Uh, if if Congress does its job, maybe Trump's time may be limited, but that's not my question. Um, I can still vote there even though I live here. Anyway, and that's not going to help either. But my question really is that chart you had, John, about that diminishing milk consumption in the states. Um, do you think, well, I guess two, two parts. Do you think we wear that because of some of the farming practices of those mass had stinky things. I remember one in Fresno that you could smell an hour away before you got to it. And then, you know, how do we sell our message of how we are farming, you know, the grass-fed, the more open, that kind of thing, to sell that concept of a better environment for producing whatever products we grow uh, on the land to that, in to that market? Um. Yeah, look, I, uh, uh, that, that chart goes back quite a long way, and there's a lot of different factors in there. I think the most important part is the acceleration downwards since 2010, which sort of coincides with when these issues really became mainstream among consumers. Um, I actually think the most important way, because New Zealand is largely, in, now there's, it's a little different in meat, but in dairy, we're largely an ingredient manufacturer. We make a lot of milk powder, we make a lot of industrial ingredients that we sell to big consumer companies. Uh, and those consumer companies are often the consumer facing part of the value chain. But um, because it's become so important to those big consumer companies, the Nestle's, the Danone's, uh, the Friesen Campinas, the big companies who really dominate that consumer space, um, they, it, it's become enormously important to them who they buy from. So they want to be able to show transparency down through the value chains and the relationship that we hold with the companies that we as farmers sell to who do the primary manufacturing and the relationship that, that they hold with those big companies is absolutely essential. And that is, you know, there's, there's got to be a lot of trust built in that as it does in any business relationship. And the importance of working with companies that are aligned on environmental issues um, is right, uh, environmental and animal welfare when it comes to dairy is right at the top, right at the top. And I, and I don't think, I, I, I think perhaps we haven't done that as well as we might have. Um, I mean, it, 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 over the years I've got to know some of the really, because as we've come up through, and, you know, you see the new up and coming companies and these other, it, so good friends who are, who are in, you know, the Danones and the Nestle's of the world. It's just, I just can't stress how important this has become in terms of who they want to do business with. And, and that, goes, that goes to pricing. Because if they, it, it's not about, you know, I know we always hear, oh, they'll just go for the lowest price anyway. They don't. It's become important enough that they will pay premiums for, the, for working with companies who are working with farmers who are doing the right things. And they are thinking about how they get involved all the way down through the value chain. So for example, with the known, you know, we're, we're involved with them on a project that's looking at carbon sequestration in soils um, on farms. So there's Danone who make all the consumer products. They, they've got a big project running figuring out how they can help farmers sequester more carbon in soils. Um, I mean, this, is, this stuff should be bread and butter to us in New Zealand. Um, uh, so that, that, that's, that's happening. Uh, Nestle, uh, I know of another project where you know, they're looking out to their supplying companies to figure out how they can help them mitigate nitrogen losses on farms. Um, you, know, it's, you know, sound familiar? There's, a, there's a Nestle who makes the big consumer products uh, running big research programs to try and figure out how to help their farmers do that. Not just in New Zealand, but they're really interested in New Zealand, but not just here. It, why? Because they know the consumers are interested in it. They'll pay premiums for it. It makes it valuable to them. It's all, it's, it's commercial. Okay, um, I'm going to ask. One, one more Sorry, Sorry, Tony. Okay. Um, 
I, I just had a, a question for John around the uncertainty piece. And look, I completely agree with um, what both John and Mel said about the need for certainty in the 2025. My concern is that if we're looking at a generational change with some of the bottom lines, and we're talking 100 years, how is the regional council in a 10-year planning framework going to respond to that without labouring some land with a label um, that means that um, it has an impact now uh, so that we can continue forward with all the great um, changes that we're trying to put in place so that we can you know, move forward into the, into the future. I'm just concerned that the 100 year time frame is, is um, a really long period and quite hard to plan for. Yeah, I'd, 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 um, like I was really heartened to hear Mel say that most of, because this is how I see it, I guess, if, if, for those who are well organised and doing the right thing, there's actually nothing terribly threatening in the current MPS, National Policy Statement for Fresh Water, that's being proposed. And actually, it's only a, there's, a, there's some important changes, but not that many changes, on what has already been built up in the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water over the last 10 years. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's already there. It's been there a long time. The, the, and, and I'd have to say the progressive uh, regional councils like ECAN are well up the curve on this stuff. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a concern out there amongst farmers that, oh, this means that all this ECAN stuff's chucked out and we're going to move to something completely new. I don't think that's right. There's some refinement around some of it that's going to be required. But they're well down the path. Um, and I think that the importance of having... Uh, I think that we should be getting to the stage where, we have, where this is the final iteration on the EP, NPS for a long time. So we get these last things nailed down. It, it, it actually goes back, politically it goes back, remember there was, um, there was this debate in the last government where they, they were going for swimmable water standards and then suddenly at the end they backed away and said, no, we're going to go for weightable. Remember that little debate? Which was a crazy thing to do. They backed away from what they should have done at the time and we would have been a lot further ahead now. Because a lot of the things that are coming in are just trying to get to that, that that's really what it's aimed at. And if we think that we're going to convince 80% of New Zealand's population that they're wrong and we should just stay with weightable, we're wrong. We're not, we're not going to get there. And so getting it locked in quickly and then enough planning so that we can get regional plans um, in place by 2025, I, I think that's reasonable. What, what you don't want is a whole lot of legal process that kicks in and draws things, things out when actually you're 80 or 90% of the way there. You can never get 100% on these things. Nick, anything you would like to add to that, given the work that you do, which yeah. is on the longer horizon as well? Um, yeah, I would, I would just like to add that um, with some of the freshwater issues that we face, um, like um, nitrogen leaching into groundwater or sedimentation, it is going to be really, really difficult to see any observable uh, changes uh, and improvements within five, ten 20-year cycle. We're dealing with, especially with the nitrogen, it's, uh, my boss, uh, Melissa, she, she refers to it as being in the post. It's already there in the soils. It's slowly working its way through into the groundwater. It could be 50 to 100 years before we see all of that come through. And so I feel like there's, there's no option but to take maybe not a 100-year view, but a multi-generational view because we're not going to solve this problem within a three-year cycle of a regional council or a 10-year planning cycle. It's going to take multiple, multiple generations. Um, the same, maybe not a big issue in Canterbury, but the same is true of sediment. It's often as a result of deforestation, which happened 150 years ago. Maybe one good example here in Canterbury is, is, is Wairiwa, um, Lake Forsyth, um, which um, has incredible issues with um, nutrients from the uh, volcanic soil around there, um, and that soil has just been allowed to flow in because of the deforestation which happened there 150 years ago. So that, that lake will, will not be back to its original quality um, and for a very, very long time. And so I think as you know, everyone, as the public, as politicians, as researchers, we all have to begin to acknowledge the huge challenge that we face and, and try not to beat each other all up about you know, not being able to see measurable improvements within three or five years for some of these things. Thank you. So I'm going to close out with one, with a question to each of the panellists. What we've heard today is we're working in 
a big macro environment. New Zealand's a tiny country and a massive supplier of food um, from our country is part of our economic prosperity. Um, the value we get from that is how we take ourselves to the world, how we communicate who we are to the world. At the moment, as an industry, we're caught up in some right here and now debates. And as we heard from um, all of our panellists, we're working in a multi-generational environment where we have to work together and we need the knowledge and the facts to keep working and there's significant opportunity and upside. So from each of you, what I'm interested in is how do we get to that conversation versus the negative, the beating each other up, the talking about each other in, in the global press around how bad we are, not around the long term that gives us intergenerational opportunity and allows us to thrive. You can choose who starts. <laughs> I can, I can start. Um, I think it's because of the passion we all have for fresh water and it's, it's so culturally ingrained in New Zealand and I think that's why it's so emotive. Um, we have, um, and it's really hard not to point fingers. So, you know, when I was looking through the National Policy for Freshwater Management and I'm going through it all, and because I live in an, in an urban setting, and I'm going, where are the bottom lines for all the heavy metals? Where are the... And, and I, I couldn't find those. And so immediately I was kind of going, oh, that's, that's a problem. But actually I had to take a step back and go, okay, what can I do? What is it that we can do? And I think that's the thing and that's the conversation we need to be having is each of us looking to solve for what we can do because our spheres of influence, depending on who we are, are very different. And so if we can reach out and we can just extend our sphere a little among the different, the different groups and entities we have around us, I think it'll be really positive. I mean, we've been, we've been doing some really great work with Arapenua, which is our local runanga. And the sorts of conversations that we're having now are around, around why and, and the importance of it, how, the, the taianga and the, 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 how it's the giver of life, it's actually really interesting because it helps inform your decision-making process and changes that mindset just a little bit. So I think it's about how do we spread that perspective for the benefit of all. Um, it's a very difficult question to answer, um, but I think um, one thing that maybe I get out of today um, and that I've been um, you know, sharing at these sort of events is that I, I actually think what we value in our fresh water is quite stable. So Mel, you were talking, you know, you don't think there are any farmers out there who want to see water quality get worse. Um, most people want to have, you know, vibrant fresh water landscapes, they want to have vibrant economies, they want to have you know, really vibrant communities as well. It's in the, the balancing of those values and trying to make decisions, um, you know, within catchments on farms and at bigger scales where the difficulties arise. Um, so as a social researcher, I think the way to have a better debate around those things is just to recognise, you know, the dependencies and interdependencies we have. So, you know, I come from an urban, urban Christchurch. Um, however, um, you know, I recognise that for the flourishing of our urban economy, we require, you know, really vibrant rural economies. And, um, you know, I think we also need to look at our interdependence, you know, on the natural environment as well. So we need to uh, continue to protect that. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. Um, and it's very difficult in, in this day and age when, you know, controversy um, and conflict seems to be what people want to attach to. Um, to really have a, you know, a, an open and, and, and a, you know, growing up debate about these sort of things. Um, yeah, look, we, we shouldn't be surprised or worried that this stuff is really hard. You know, this is complicated. It's complicated because we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing with scientific understanding that's caught up with 100 years mm -hmm. of development. It's not, it's not actually about dairy. I know I talked about a lot about dairy, it's, but, but here in Canterbury, it's about what's happened over the last... It's, it's, it, you can probably take it back hundreds of years to, you know, when... Land drainage. Yeah, yeah but, but, but even when the forest came, it got burned down yep. and then, you know, the remaining forests got taken down and irrigation, you know, it's, it's, we're dealing with the consequences of a long period of time and it's going to take a long time to work our way through. Um, the, the thing I like to remind myself is that... Um, you know, everybody is doing the best they can. I don't, I don't meet people who don't care or who um, 
get out, or, and you especially don't make people get out of bed in the morning to do a bad job, right? In this space or any other space, people generally people aren't wired up that way. So everyone's trying to do a good job. And, and the, the other thing that I think that um, that I see is really positive, and I actually think is a driver and behind a lot of this, is that we're no longer dealing with faceless markets or faceless countries. You know, we, in New Zealand, we've got to get rid of this export word. You know, export's sort of a nonsense thing. It, it, it dumps these things down to the point that we just produce stuff and put it on a boat and send it away. That's, the world's just not like that anymore. We have farming families and people who are, who are very proud of the food they produce, and they're going to, far, to families who eat it who really care and want to know and can know where it came from and how it was produced. Like, I mean, that's hugely positive, I think, and is, is one of the fundamental drivers behind all this. And if we think about it the right way, it can, be, can drive enormous value into a place like New Zealand. Um, this connection that we can have with consumers who are buying real products, who value those products for more than just the nutritional filling their tummies. And um, they want to engage. Now, that's, I, I think that's just enormously, um, that has enormous potential in it for, you know, for the likes of your lad. Because in his, in his generation, he will have a direct relationship with the people who are eating the food at the other end. And they will be prepared to and pay for that. Um, you know, people work with the people they like. And, and I think that this, this is all of this debate and the things that we're doing is helping position New Zealand well for the decades to come where all this is going to become enormously important. Thank you. So like our three panellists, um, you know, why blink innovation and why do I do what I do is there is so much opportunity. I'm seeing some amazing new companies start up that are actually working right across the value chain, looking at those consumer trends, working with farmers, putting in new systems, new infrastructure for who knows if they're some of our big future but they're doing it and it comes from their heart, from seeing opportunity, from their own life experiences, because they're entrepreneurial. And that's what we've been founded on. Um, so I'd really encourage that we start to look at the opportunity. We do stand side by side. We do work together on it. Um, we've got a lot to be proud for, but we've got work to do. But we've always got work to do. We've always had work to do. Um, we're getting a lot more information and it is overwhelming. So please use the opportunities that are provided by the different organisations you're part of, you work with, um, you fund, you're part of the cooperatives. They're doing an amazing job across the country and it is hard. It is difficult at the moment. Um, the amount that's coming at us, the noise that's coming at us. How do we get through that noise and find the fact? Um, it is complex. It's a bit of playing whack-a-mole as well. If we do something over here, what's the unintended consequence? We now have more information, but we also have voices to ask those questions and to find out sometimes there's not answers, which actually helps inf us inform us around what we need to do next, what we need to think about next. So your voice is important your individual actions are important. And together, we keep saying New Zealand's not important in terms of global emissions. We are important because we do lead the way, we do innovate, and the small country can go faster. And what that gives us is opportunity, um, whether it's selling new services, selling new products, helping guide the world, and actually making us a better place as well. So um, I've been a bit distraught by what I've seen over the last little while, the last two months, and seen um, farmers and the conversation at a level I've never seen in the time I've been across the industry. Um, and being able to step back and reflect what I've seen around the world and where we are. So um, keep turning up, keep leading, and thank you um, for your time today. Um, we do have some other events coming up. Those of you um, that are around PGG Rights and Seeds has moved into the Lincoln Precinct, so getting to talk to them and understand their vision for the future under their new ownership. And then if you're at the Canterbury Show on the 13th of um, November, um, we're running um, two of these sessions across the morning um, with, a, with a range of panellists as well. So thank you, have a great day, and um, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.